kind of where the magic happens. Everything is different in this shop. This is a full custom racing piston shop. Every piston is actually oval. We're about to show you how high performance rods and pistons get made at the CP Carrillo factory and headquarters here in Irvine, California. And we're here with Lake Speed Jr. I'm your doorman. <laughs> Got a real Stark Industries vibe in here, I like it. Are the rods and pistons kind of made in conjunction or do they have separate line areas? Which one are we gonna see uh, we, first? We manufacture them in two different sides of the shop. So we're gonna show you how the pistons get made first. We have a variety of different forgings. Um, this is what we call a round forging, which is similar to Lake's original um, round style piston. And then this is what we would call an X style piston. Um, not fully boxed, it's just got some small ribs in there because most of the compression heights are really short and this is used primarily for motorcycles. You also have this one, it's a little different color. It's 4032 material. This is for one of our crate engine projects that we do. And then we have somewhere around 250 to 300 different piston forgings. So with the acquisition of Arius and everything else that we do, we have some really large stuff and some small stuff and we do everything from mid to high 50 millimeters all the way to six inch in diameter air compressors airplanes so this is the initial milling operation uh one cool thing about the company is that we went from having a lot of different stations doing lots of different operations to using palletized or, or tombstone systems and, and uh, horizontal milling machines. So you can load multiple machines as a single operator and you can do machining in the back while you're loading the front and then it'll cycle through and it helps with your production. Are all these machines sort of doing the same thing? They're just different all these things? Machines are, all those three machines right there are actually doing the identical same thing. They're tooled up the same. There's nothing different about them. Um, this particular one, we actually do a lot of the, the old school, big area style parts on there. And then we can flip and flop however we need to based on quantities and, you know, just all the other variables that come into play. If a machine goes down or you're servicing one or whatever the case may be. We also do billets. Um, start with slugs of aluminum and we manufacture any shape we want out of that so that that way we can either do prototyping or we might do something where it's just not gonna be frequent enough to forge it. Maybe you don't wanna invest the money in the tooling or maybe there's changes to it like an NHRA Pro Stock thing where you change it so frequently you don't wanna be locked into a forge. Here's before and after on that. So this slug gets loaded in there and it comes back out looking like that but it doesn't have the pinhole or yeah any of the top. And, so i mean you you can actually run the piston operation like this isn't the piston operation this is the billet operation you could run the piston operation simultaneously without removing it from the machine if you wanted to just based on what we're doing for this particular thing uh that's not the way that we're going to do it on this one so you're just basically bringing the slug to where the 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 forging already is and then go yeah, from there. Yeah, well, there's no forging, it's a billet. I mean, yeah. it's a forged piece of extruded bar stock. And, you know, we have a variety of different sizes. Some of them are huge and some are small, some are short, some are tall. That's the fun stuff for me, because that's where I get to design anything I want and bounce ideas up back and forth off the customer and really get progress made in developing things and figuring out what works and what doesn't. So after the initial milling operation, apparently we stack them. <laughs> So we have uh, rough milling. Um, basically, we take apart and we remove as much material from it as possible so that we relieve that and uh, machine as little as humanly possible down the line. Well, this one's not running right now, but you can see all the different live tooling in there. Man, that is insane. So that one's cutting ring grooves? Roughing. Uh, yeah, um, so it's facing the top of the piston, it's turning the OD, it's it's roughing the ring grooves and a variety of other things so that that way when we finish the part on the finish lathe, there's not a whole lot of work to do and there's not a lot of material to be removed. So that's what it looks like prior to going into the machine. What is, 
coming out of the machine, you'll get all the different things that we just mentioned. Basically, it's similar in, in most regards to the other parts are just different in size or there might be some dimensional characteristics that are different, but in general, that's what you're gonna get it to look like when it's coming off of this operation. I think people can use their imaginations. Yeah. There's, there's so many different things going through here. It's not just like a factory where the same four things get made all no, the time. I mean, we, we do have an OEM building across the street and granted they've grown and we have a variety of projects that we do over there but they are set up to run large production runs of the same stuff, whereas everything is different in this shop. This is a full custom racing piston shop. So, um, and then as you'll see on the connecting rod side, it's kind of a combination of both. Primarily all racing with some OEM type rod development as well. But when you start off with that stuff, you have to, mingle it with your racing machines and parts until you can build the case to invest enough money to segregate it and move it over to something else. This is a milling operation where we do the top of the piston. It's just one of several machines that we use for that. Put the valve reliefs in the top of the piston. We do profiling on the top of the piston. If the piston has, this is called an inverted dome. A dish to us in our terminology is completely round and it's done on a lathe. This is an inverted dome, which means that it's not a positive dome, but it's negative. The valve reliefs and all the other little clips and doodads on the top of that piston are done in this machine here. So this this is an inverted dome because it isn't it doesn't go round out to here. Yeah, it's done on a mill, so it's Okay. Yeah. So a dish would be spun on a lathe. Okay. And, for us, some rather large billets, Hemi, Hemi style billet. That is yeah. enormous. Yeah. That is massive. So this particular operation is finishing. Everybody's on lunch right now. So the good thing is we get to crash their operation area and talk about whatever we want. Uh, the bad thing is it makes us look like nobody's working right now. <laughs> but that's, that's okay. That's pretty normal. We usually it's film lunch. these when, at the end of the day or during lunch because yeah. we can't get in people's ways or we can't see really what's we happening. We have about 210 employees right now, so it's, uh, it's grown quite a bit. Uh, this particular operation uh, takes a piston. Let's see here. So, Blake, why don't you grab one of those? looks like it's a similar this is roughed and this is finished so you got all your ring groove finished you got your accumulator groove you got your cam and barrel shape on the skirts all the chamfers and the radii under the oil ring and the radii on the bottom of the piston and uh any other deburring little stuff that can be done on a lathe uh this is kind of where the magic happens when we talked about the things you can see and can't see, even though you can kind of see the difference here, the the difference in what you actually get done on this part is, is pretty uh, amazing because that's what determines how it runs in the engine. That's yeah. the shape on the skirt, the clearance in the ring grooves, that's the diameter of the ring lands, what touches the bore, what doesn't, and all the other bells and whistles. Some Mission look. critical stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So no piston is round. Uh, every piston is actually oval and it's also got um, a barrel shape is what we call it where it's smaller under the oil ring than it is down here because it grows more in this area than it does down here. Hmm. And then if you look at the bottom of the piston, this has the majority of the material so it's going to grow more in this area than it is here. So. It's actually an oval in this direction, and it's smaller here than it is here. And that's, that's just the general statement you can make about all pistons. Wow. Without so you, getting into the juicy details. So right. you have it all factored in to essentially, when it expands, be round. Is it an iron block? Is it an aluminum block? Is it forced induction? Is it naturally aspirated? Is it... A cold cooling system? Is it desert? Is it an offshore boat? What are what are we doing? And that's going to dictate everything that we need to know about the dimensional changes that we make to the part. Do you change the profile 
between 2618 and 4032? Uh, yeah, we, we, we do it with four gene structural changes. We change it with 4032. A lot of the 4032 pistons that we manufacture today are generally used for either street applications or vintage applications. Right. So uh, with, that, with that being said, yeah. there, there's, there's a lot of other differences besides just the material. A lot of the parts are longer. Uh, the forging selections are different and okay. stuff like that too. So uh, yeah, there's, there's generally, you know, your growth rate's gonna be a little different to run things tighter. Uh, Something I'm noticing is that there's one of these start slabs at every single station here. Yeah. yeah. The detail uh, is impressive. Yeah, I mean, we could still use a little organization if you ask me, but that's okay, you know? We're, we're working on that. We're about ready to reorganize the whole shop move things around and, and get real clean. Um, but in general, yes, uh, we use that for everything because it's necessary to have a good flat surface to measure on. Otherwise, what are you measuring to? If you're enjoying this video, hit that subscribe button because there's all kinds of stuff on our channel that you would be just as into as this, maybe even more. If you click the little bell, it will tell you when we post something, at least it should. I don't know, give it a shot. Anyway, back to the video. We pride ourselves in having good equipment and good people and good measuring devices. Does everything get measured before it moves to the next station? Oh yeah, and everything. recorded. And uh, lots of times in sequence and serialized as well. The traceability efforts are becoming better and better on racing uh, over time. And the, the traceability efforts on the OEM side are uh, as good as you can possibly have. It's like Scooter always says, you can't improve what you can't measure. So yep. you, you got you want to make it better, you got to be able to measure it. You got to be able to measure better than you do today in order to make a part better tomorrow than you did today. So it just depends on what it is and, and how it's going through the production facility. Um, part of the reason we're reorganizing the shop is because, as you can tell, we're walking from one side to the other right now. Uh, and we want to go in a circle if we can, right? So um, with, with OEM becoming more and more involved in what we do, uh, we've had to juggle some equipment and do some things around here. So uh, over here, this is where we remove the registration of the part off of the bottom and we match the weights and we do some of the drilling for the conventional pen oiling methods and so on and so forth. Um, this machine here is another mill that does the top of the piston like the one that we were just talking about two operations ago. And then the other ones down this line cut the bottom of the piston and match all the weights. They get honed. Actually, they get deburred and then honed because we try to keep the guys from cutting themselves up with parts. So, um, yeah. And then once they get deburred and honed, we wash them and we do some inspection and then we approve it to go out the door and we go to the other building where we ship from. So shipping used to be in this building, but with the growth of the company, we've actually got another building down the street. So we got a guy shuffling parts all over the, all over the city blocks around here. So the pistons are, I don't know, for a, a type of like how it's made thing, they're relatively simple because they only go to a few different places and then they're like, yeah, the you gotta, you gotta piston. Is, it's got way more operations. It's steel. Uh, there's a lot going on. You got fasteners involved and all the other things on the rod side. That's interesting because on the, when you look at them, a piston is much more intricate, but as far as like the manufacturing yeah, process, that's, that's it's kind the of, other that's way. That's kind of the jab session that the rod and piston guys always have, right? It's like, you know, the rods are just holding the crank and the piston together and it's just <laughs> a simple thing. And then the piston's got so many exotic shapes on the top because all the cylinder head, different cylinder head variations that you have out there. So, um, but it's a lot easier to make. Now, don't get me wrong, when we first made them, there was way more operations than there are today. In anything that you do, the least amount of times you can remove a part from a machine, the better off you are. Uh, and your tolerance stack is tight. So um, we've worked on that uh, and come a, come a long way and uh, the rod side is making significant progress as well. So 
Let's go. Let's go see how the rods get done. With the connecting rod, we actually start the operation down the street, uh, and that's where our forging, so all our raw and finished materials are in the other building, and basically we, we do some boring processes over there so that we can prepare to put them on the machines over here. Um, so these machines um, are all doing a similar thing. We refer to it as profiling which takes the majority of the material off of the connecting rod and gives it the general shape that you're looking for. Here's one prior to, and here's one after. Yeah, that's cool. So when you hear forged rod versus cast rod, when you got a forged rod, it starts as one of these slugs. Well, forged rod versus a billet rod too, right? So the thing that we try to pride ourselves on is the fact that everything we do is forged so we actually get the grain flow to go the way that we want it to go. Uh, billet rod has a straight line grain and ours don't. So it's 100% machine so when it's done you can't tell the difference between a billet and a forged rod but um, so these are like billet forged rods. It's a hundred percent machine forged. Yes. And that's different than either one of the other things. Yes. You got them combined here. Yeah. So uh, that's the way it's always been. Uh, and then we also manufacture aluminum connecting rods now, um, which you can see there. Yeah. Is this for like a? pro stock deal or something uh, that's actually an import we got a lot of rods going right now though the the rod side you know as the industry was up and down and uh, you know we were coming back from a pandemic uh, we're fortunate enough to be very busy in a nice to have industry right so um, we're thriving we're having record months finally it's slowing down a little bit on the piston side the rod side is still pretty hectic. Uh, I think we're 14 weeks or so for a set of connecting rods, and we're down to about five weeks for pistons right now. So. Oh wow. Um, what are those itty bitty rods for? Uh, it might be for like a Hibusa, like a little motorcycle racing. Kawasaki. So this is some of the area where the, the final boring is done. Um, you know, there's some rods actually get serrations on the party line so that they are stuck together in that way. Some are sleeved, some are serrated. Um, there's a variety of different methods that we use. We have some reverse entry connecting rods like that where the bolts come in from the top and then the majority of them come in from the bottom. This is a bullet connecting rod. I don't remember if you have these in yours or not. I think that's what I will have in the six liter for the Yukon. Okay. Yeah. So similar material, similar manufacturing process. There's some steps that are able to be skipped so that that way we don't have to spend as much time and effort on some aspects of it. Uh, it's kind of a win-win for the customer because it's a lesser price and it's something that we came up with to compete in the lower market share. And when I say lower, I'm just talking price, not quality. Um, so that's what we have come up with on the bullet. We do a lot of LS stuff, a lot of big blocks, uh, and a variety of others that are coming to market right now. Romero, how long have you been with Carrillo? 40 years. 40 years. A lot of these guys have been working for the company for a long time. So, Romero's the one that actually helped us get your rods prepared for CMM, and he's the one that would rework the rods as well if we needed to do that. So. What is he doing now? Uh, recalibrating the home gauge to make sure that we are measuring things properly when honing. Huh. And then we also check our home gauge against the CMM to make sure that those are the same. And we have to yeah. let them sit in there. Showing their undersized six tenths, and it is what it, what it is, so we have to re-hone it. 
know, have to give it a little more to come and to. So when it's undersized in the QA lab, it probably raises a flag and it makes him say, oh, wait a second. So he's checking the gauge and now he realizes that those are both accurate, the same, so the part is undersized. So they're gonna go back out, and make sure that they rehome the thing and get it where they need to be. So it's double verified. Yeah. Yes, double check. Always want to make sure before he goes oversized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Better double, triple, quadruple check in the underside. Yeah. The metal taker offer, metal putter on her. The taker offer is way easier than the putter on her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he knows how to do the putter on her part too, though. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we've got a lot of equipment that's older, refurbished, constantly maintained, and still works and does well for, for everything that we're trying to do. Uh, this is where we actually do the shock painting of the steel connecting rods and uh, What is shock painting? Shock painting is when you take small steel balls and you use them at high speed to Go up a piece of, uh, against a piece of material to work hard in the surface remove machining marks and other things and remove areas of high stress so if it's done correctly it can also be done incorrectly it can be done too much so there's a variety of different things that it can be or are done with shop painting changes the color makes it go from like this to what we normally know a rod looks like uh. so that that's as a machine it looks like this but yeah. then, like you said but that machining process can put residual stresses and things in there so then you shot beat it and it takes those stresses out. Huh. And it gives it that Carrillo look that everybody's always known, you know. Yeah. So as he starts to get that thing going and we can feel the shot flying around in the air, we should probably start him. Yeah. yeah. Why? Usually our vibratory deburring is right here because back back in the old days, you know, the guys would do it all by hand and then vibratory deburring came online and then that allowed us to actually take employees and use them for inspectors and drivers and you know they would they wouldn't be relieved of their duties they would be displaced and moved around in the company so we could use their skills in other areas so um but unfortunately that piece of equipment's down at the moment so uh generally that's where we do all of our deburring with a vibratory deburring final assembly rafael has been doing this for a long time and uh you know basically preparing the parts so that that way we can get them ready for the customer oil them down uh demagnetizing them and, and getting them ready to go if you like this kind of tech stuff make sure you're subscribed click the button you click the little bell and then it'll just tell you when we post something that's it and you can check out the Lake Speed engine playlist for all kinds of technical engine information, including the differences in the pistons, the real, the real nitty gritty of piston design. We have a video in there with Brian. We go on his computer, shows all the 3D stuff. You'll love it. What? Were you talking to her? No, oh. I wasn't talking to her. Was I talking to you? Are you gonna go watch the piston video, Shelby? Yeah, she is. She loves 3D piston design and all those other things. Cool socks.